All right, everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA slate for tomorrow, and this is kind of a later look. Uh, if you guys followed along, I did an early look just as I saw the salaries, and I was very curious to see how my takes would change during the course of the week as I absorbed more data, absorbed more takes, absorbed more industry noise, absorbed more, absorbed more industry goodness. Um, and that's part of the key to, to life is to knowing how to separate the noise from the goodness. Um, it is a very, very uh, tough slate. It's, it's definitely a slate that if you were 150 maxer, 150 maxer, you do have a pretty decent edge over the, over the single entry players because um, there's just a lot of ways that this can go. But let me, let me highlight a couple of things um, that, is, that have changed. Um, one of them being, and this is very bizarre, that the fight between um, what's his name? Where'd it go? Right. Menefield and Moskroff. So this fight was already slated as the fight with the highest likelihood of finishing. You look at the inside the distance prop and it's minus 500 to, to actually minus 900 on the other side, plus 500 to, to finish. And it was, it was, it's actually gotten higher recently. And that's because news has come out that Moskorov essentially lied about his record. They basically inserted fights in and results in that were just fraudulent or something like that, um, which is exceedingly bizarre. But nonetheless, uh, as a result, the line on Menafield has gone from where it was, which is minus about 210, to minus about 250. And the inside the distance prop has also become more juicy. So... The first thing you'll notice is that even though he's a minus 250 or minus 260, remember, they can't really change the price on DraftKings at this point. So what you're left with is a guy priced basically as if he were maybe a dollar 70 favorite um, who's actually a minus 250. Add to that the fact that the inside the distance prop is getting even more juicy this is, even for a 14-15 game slate, uh, fight slate, this is starting to feel like a virtual lock. Um, you get the combination of, of a, now a misprice with, with incredible inside the distance prop. And yeah, so, so that's, that's the first thing, is that that's the one thing that has, that has changed, at least structurally, over the last couple of days. Um, as for everything else, I mean, let's 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 look at another at another way. Let, let's look at the above nine K guys first. Okay, then we'll get back to the main event and some of the mid range fights, because what you have are one, two, three, really four fighters that are in contention for you know highest highest fantasy score, right? of the non meta fields. Now meta field, you could argue has, I mean, he could, he could finish this fight in 30 seconds and get 130 points, you know? So it's very possible that meta field could be the highest score at 8,700. But as far as the uh, above nine K guys, you know, Blanche field, Jackson, Evluev and, 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 um, and Fakradinov. And I think it's important to compare all these um, because look, you're not going to play, I don't even think you're going to play two of them and you certainly can't play three of them. So you are going to have to prioritize. Now, the thing is, is that from an ownership perspective, I really don't think that there's going to be that much of a difference between all four of these. I mean, I'm looking at ownership projections and I put them up on the site and that, then I look, I, I watched a pretty well respected podcast where they were just telling me that, that Evloev is going to be low owned. I, I just can't imagine that. So I'm going to operate under the assumption that all four of these guys are going to be equally owned to some degree. So if you're going to try to separate these, I mean, how do you do it? Well, 
let's go, let's, let's start with the numbers, right? So we're gonna start with comparing apples to apples, I suppose. Let's look at all the different uh, implied win odds. You have Blanchfield is a minus 500. But then you have Fakradinov is only a minus 275. And then you have Jackson is a minus 600. So Jackson's a little bit higher than Blanchfield. And then, um, is that it? Did I miss one? One, two, three, and Evloev, sorry. And Evloev is a minus 400. So when you think about it, I think they are all priced relatively efficiently, right? Because Fakradinov is, is the cheapest at only 9,200. And he has, you know, the lower winning percentage, right? And he's minus two, 270. If you're just going to look at the win odds, though, and the win equity, I guess that I guess you really can't make a state a statement that anyone's better than the other, right? Given the given the, the win odds versus the price, I think they're all priced relatively efficiently. But let's look at the non-win odds uh, situation. Let's look at the at the the possibility or the probability that these guys get the score needed. You know what I mean? Because it's not just enough to win at that price. You've got to really smash. So let's take a look at some of these inside the distance props. So you have Fakradinov with an inside the distance prop of, uh, it's minus 200, doesn't go to decision. Um, and for him specifically, you have um, him inside the distance is about a pick -em. So let's remember that. So inside the distance is about a pick -em for Fakradinov, and he's the 9,200 guy, and he's minus 260. And you compare that to say, let's, let's start at the, uh, let's, let's actually start with Blanchfield. Let's just start with that one. Collapse this, and we'll go to Blanchfield. And the inside the distance prop on Blanchfield is extremely poor. You know, it's minus 200 um, that, it, that it goes to decision. So already it, it seems as though Blanchfield, well, that seems kind of weak, but let's take a look at Blanchfield inside it. Blanchfield inside the distance is plus 250. So for me, I mean, I probably so far, I'm, I'm making Blanchfield my least likely of these. Um, but let's, let's, go, let's go on. Let's look at Jackson. Damon, Damon Jackson at the minus one six at minus six hundred or whatever. Minus two hundred fight doesn't go to decision overall. But again, let's look at him. You know, at his prop, which is pretty similar. You have Jackson. Where is this? Jackson wins by TKO in first round. There's so many of these. It's hard to even see what his inside the distance prop is just for him, right? Jackson wins by decision plus 250. Oh, okay. Jackson went inside the distance minus 150. So he's slightly more likely to win inside the distance than, than, uh, than, than Rachmaninoff, whatever his name was. Not Rachmaninoff, obviously. Um, and he's being priced at 9,600. So, so far, I still feel, I think that him and, and the Rachmaninoff are very, are very similar, given the price, given everything else. And let's take a look at Evloev, just from the perspective of inside the distance. Um, the inside the distance prop is really poor. It's plus 225, plus 250, which means his inside the distance prop is also going to be very poor, which is going to make him, let's take a look at it. Inside the distance is plus 380. Okay. So at first glance, you would think, okay, Evloev is the least likely of these four to score well. You have um, then Blanchfield, and then you have a close between Jackson and um, Rachmaninoff. But it's not just the finishing upside that we have to consider. Remember, is that is that we've seen we've seen wrestlers and grapplers 
pile up incredible amount of fantasy points in their decisions. We've seen 135 out of Chase Hooper. We've seen 150 or 140 out of Chase Hooper. We've seen 150 out of um, and the name escapes me from one of the co-main events. Not Calvin Kadar. I, I, I forget his name. Whatever, whatever it is. Um, big, big time scores for takedowns. That that other kind of free square fight from that same card. 150 points over the course of three rounds and takedowns. So, so you have to really give respect to that and. That's where the Evloev projection kind of gets a little funky, right? Because even though he doesn't have the greatest inside the distance prop, his entire path to victory is from multiple takedowns. Um, so I actually regard Evloev as very similar to those other three. Um, uh, the, the other two. And the other one you have to think about is Blanchfield, right? And, and Blanchfield also has the ability to get multiple takedowns. So, so she also makes up for that lack of a, of a good inside the distance prop with, um, with good grappling upset. The only thing I would say is that Aldridge is kind of known for having decent takedown defense. So there's that. So all of that is to say that given all the balances, imbalances, wrestling upside, all that stuff. I have to say once again, that I think they're all four equal and that you really don't need to prioritize one over the other, which then leads us to, 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 to consider, you know, if you're gonna play the cheaper of these, that's probably the better idea, right? Because that's gonna allow you to just get better the rest of your lineups. So if you're playing 150, I would, I would not make any stands on any of these four. I would just, you know, either get them all equal or let the projections kind of roll. But I, I think that all four of these should be treated as equal. Okay. I think we already talked about the Menafield fight with the exception of the, the question of whether you should be playing Moskarov as, uh, as well. Well, let's let's let the numbers kind of kind of decide this. And and interestingly, you do have Moskarov winning by TKO at plus 175, which is actually can't possibly be the case because I actually you can because you're, you're it's so close to what his 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 odds win in the fight are. I mean, so Basically, what that means is that, well, think about this. They actually have, it's almost an arbitrage here. Like, like literally every, not quite, but I would say almost every single time Moskov wins, it's by KO. And, and, and to take that to the next level, I mean, if he's only 7K, every time that he wins, he's in the optimal pretty much, right? I mean, look, you can get like, eight other guys to, to outscore him, but hell at 7k um, or 7,300, whatever he is, 7,500. I mean, that's, that's a big number. So you got to think about this. So if he's, so 33% of the time, right. That's if you're a two to one dog, right. 33% of the time, this guy's in the optimal. It's a lot. That's a lot. I, I would play him, you know, which basically means that you should probably have 100% of that fight. That's the way you get to these types of analyses. Um, next, let, let's, let's, let's talk about some of the underdogs in those four big fights. And then we'll get back to some of these mid rangers uh, I didn't expect this to be long, but I see it heading that way. But that's fine. I usually make these five minutes. And we haven't even talked about the main event yet. So do we want to play these um, these big underdogs, like Ige at 6,800, for example, or Aldridge at 6,800. So here, here's the problem. The problem here is that with a guy like Ige, I think if Ige wins, he doesn't really have that win condition. In other words, I think if he wins, 
he might, he's probably going to win in some kind of decision. You know, you know I don't, and, and while it's 6,800, you know, winning a decision at say 10 X, you know, it seems to mean something it really doesn't because you need to score on a card with 14 fights. I think you really need to score hundred. I mean, because there's so many fights here that could score big that I just don't think that Ige, even in the, you know, look, he's three to one underdogs. That means what? 25% of the time he wins. I don't think that he's guaranteed to be in the optimal if he wins. That's why the other guy, Moskov, is so much better of an underdog. Um, and I think same thing with Aldridge. I don't think Aldridge is going to win by, you know, with, with getting a big score. I think if anything, she's going to grind out a tough split decision. The interesting other one that you might consider is Mitchellitis. And the only reason I bring it up is because he is, um, he does have grappling. Okay. So since he does have grappling in his wins, I think it's possible that he could actually score. Okay. Um, the, the other thing is that if these guys both decide to try to grapple and it turns into a striking battle, he certainly could get a KO. But I don't think again, that his underdog status is quite as good as that, as that, um, what's his name as the Moscow. I mean, all these guys are probably going to lose. Right. But if case they win, I want to make sure that they're scoring. That's, that's, that's my, that's my idea here. Okay. Let's take a look at some of these others. So, so first of all, you have Triziano against Almeida. He's the last of the nine K fighters. The only thing I will say about him is that if you do play him, you're going to get extremely low ownership because he has a very poor inside the distance prop no one's going to play him because they're all going to be playing all those other nine Ks. So, or you're going to, they're going to pay down a men field or some of these others. So if you do play Triziano and you get lucky and you get the KO, I mean, you're, you're really, really in business. Um, but that's only going to happen. It looks to be, you know, 20% of the time. I mean, to win by TKO, he's 20 minus plus 500. And that doesn't even mean, you know, a KO that we necessarily want. Like, if he gets a KO in the third round, that might not even be enough. Um, with respect to Almeida, you have Almeida winning inside the distance at plus 450 or plus 425. That's not really good. You know, that, that's only, only going to happen maybe, what's that, 20% of the time? So 20% of the time, is he in the optimal? Um, yeah, maybe, probably. And so I guess that's not that bad. But again, I like the Oskarov guy better uh, as far as those types of underdogs. Um, let's 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 kind of go down the salaries. Let's do it that way. So Odie Osborne against uh, Adesha. Um Let's take a look. Uh, win odds seems pretty efficient. Fight doesn't go to decision line. is actually pretty poor. I mean, it's about pick them. It's not terrible. And I, I have seen that Osborne has some, you know, grappling upside, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think he stands out as a particularly great play. You know, like I said, I mean, he might get low ownership and listen, I'm not going to argue with low owned players, but um, when you, when you, when you have Menafield just sitting there right below me, 8,700, it's very, very difficult to click the Osborne button. Look, you could try to play them both, but um but I think that it's not nearly as good of a play as, as that other 8,700, like I mentioned. Uh, Selecki against De Silva, uh, pretty interesting. You do have, again, kind of a pick them if it doesn't go to decision, but now the, 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 the prices are getting a little more crunched. Yeah, but even still, 8,800 versus 7,400. If anything, I think Selecki is kind of a live underdog here. I mean, from what I've heard, he does have some grappling and some wrestling upside. So once again, if he wins, he's probably going to score decently. So, well, I'm not Selecki. I meant De Silva. So while I'm not really too into Selecki, given his, you know, relatively poor inside the distance prop, given his price, I think De Silva given his wrapping upside does, does merit a look. 
And oh, before I forgot, the uh, Damon Jackson Argetta uh, to, to deal with his uh, 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 the possibility of playing Argetta as an underdog. I mean, I will say this, that Argetta is supposedly a wrestler. So I suppose if he wins, it's going to be because he did good wrestling. I don't see it, but I, I, I guess he's fine. I, I would prefer him over Ige if that helps. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to get to him. Okay, here's another fight, which I kind of, uh, well, let's, let's, we'll get to that in a second. Let's, let's deal with this one, Molina and Juma Gulov. And I have to say that if there's, the industry is all over the place on this fight. I mean, I got one site that, that's projecting Molina as the top overall scorer. I have, an, I have another site that's projecting him as, as almost a huge, complete fade. Um, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, so I'm just going to kind of let the numbers kind of dictate what I'm doing here. And we're going to start with the fact that the fight doesn't go to decision is extremely poor. I mean, it's about, it's a plus 160 pretty much that this thing goes to decision. What's keeping Molina's um, popularity up maybe is because he does throw volume, you know, and he's got a couple of really good results where he just, he just had an incredible amount of strikes. And that is another way that you can, that you can generate a lot of fantasy points. Um, but I don't think that that type of, of, of approach is, is repeatable, you know, and, and, and Juma Gulov, I mean, he's, he's, he knows what he's doing. You know, he's, um, I don't think he's just going to get run over here. He's got also some, some grappling and some wrestling that Molina has faced some troubles with. So, um, I have to say that if anything in this fight, I would probably favor Juma Gulov as in DFS, because again, he's going to win the fight, you know, 40% of the time. And the 40% of the time that he wins, I think it's going to be because of his wrestling, which means that he's going to score decently. So I think that he's a pretty decent underdog. And I just don't think I'm going to get to Molina. Um, so we're only down to a couple of more fights here. So we, let, let's deal with, with first the, um, the two women's fights, and then we'll finish up with two with, with kind of a, one other kind of mid, middling fight, and one kind of key fight, I think. We'll wait for that till the end. Um, first female fight, which is not that interesting, is Harry versus Kalilevich. Um, pick them fight, terrible inside the distance prop, just literally no interest. Now one of them is going to obviously win in one round. Um, Silva against Pot Potelejo. Um, Looks pretty similar to me, if you want to know the truth. You have, well, it's actually not bad. It's not actually a pick em inside the distance. And I have to say, for women's MMA, that's pretty fair. You know, it's almost a pick em here. So let's take a look. Let's, let's drill down a little bit more here. You have Silva wins inside the distance, plus 275. So 30% of the time, pretty much, she's going to win inside the distance. At 8K, is that enough? Maybe. Her inside the distance prop is better than Botello, who's the favorite. That's, that's somewhat interesting. So I guess, if anything, I would, I would go with Silva. Um, I hope I don't have to play this fight, but, but if anything, I would go with Silva for, for, for those reasons. Um, St. Denise Stoltz, you have Sinise. Denise coming off a big layoff after getting the crap beat out of him. Um, minus 155. Inside the distance prop is okay, minus 130 or so. Um, no real lean either way. Pricing is decent. So if you get to either of these guys, I think it's fine. They're not priorities for me, but, but again, you play 150, you're going to get to some of these, and I wouldn't you know, take them out. And the final fight, which I, again, I do this on purpose, but I still think this is a, a really, really important fight here um, from a DraftKings perspective. You have Gravely against Munoz, and, and the, the, the pricing is, what, 80, 84 versus 7,800? And I don't know why my original take this week was not, was not supported by a lot of the crew here, by a lot of the industry, because what, what I – and I'm going to stick with this. So – I feel as though 
both of these fighters are perfect, have perfect win conditions. In other words, Gravely is going to try to get this to the mat. I mean, what am I seeing that no one else is seeing? I haven't heard about this all week. His last fight, he had 11 takedowns. I mean, for real? And then he got KO'd around the, the fight before that, but then he had four takedowns, seven takedowns. I, I mean, this is what the guy does. And, and not only that, but from what I've heard, Munoz actually likes to be taken to the crown. I mean, he's a submission guy. So he's looking to get taken to the ground. So maybe he re can reverse you or something like that. So I think that both these guys are putting themselves in a perfect position for their win condition. And Munoz with his finishing upside and Gravely with his takedown upside and their prices. I mean, I have to say that if you're, listen, if you're, and, and this is kind of the summary of this whole card, if you're 20 maxing this card, I, I can't imagine not playing both those fights. Now, the, the interesting thing is the one fight that we kind of left off here is the main event. And I usually start with it, but let's, let's, let's just deal with it. Listen, first of all, main event having five rounds is always appealing. Okay. Um, and the thing is, is that I'm hearing a lot of buzz this week about how the main event doesn't have to be played this week. Listen, don't, don't sell the main event short. Don't sell five rounds short. You know, Volkov is a, is, a, is a technical kickboxer type. If you give him five rounds to beat on Rosenstruck, with Rosenstruck not really, like, you know, moving around all that much, he can, he can, he can pile up a lot of fantasy points at 8,400. So I would not, or 8,600, so I would not sell that short. Um, if you get him at, say, 25% ownership, I would probably try it. Um, and then Rosenstruck, I mean – Look, he's plus 140, and just him inside the distance is plus 180. I mean, think about this. I mean, th basically 33% of the time, he finishes him and is probably in the optimum. So this is a guy that you, ju you just kind of happen to play, right, as an one of your underdogs. So it's interesting, you know, you have a 14 fight slate, which you can make somewhat small if you do what I said, right? I'm not saying it's going to work, but this is what I think is a really good advice is you lock in the Gravely fight, fight you lock in the Menafield fight. And in this particular case, you know, you, you, maybe you lock in the main, okay? Because it's not going to be as highly owned as everybody thinks, okay? And once you do that, Hopefully you get one of those 9K guys in. <laughs> and you probably should be able to. You're not going to be able to get two. Um, but but can you? Let's let's see. Let's say you did what I said and you locked in those um those fights. And let's say you ended up with the underdogs and all, which is okay. So you have Maserov at 7,500, you get Rosenstruck at 7,600, and you get um Munoz at 7,800. OK, um, you could play probably two of those nine Ks and a mid range and, and get that done. Um, so that's what I would recommend for 20 max 150. Just, you know, feel feel free to do whatever you want, because um, pretty much anybody can win. Um, but uh, as far as 20 max, I think that's probably the intelligent approach. Uh, that will do it. Good luck, everybody. And oh, it's early slate tomorrow. Make sure that you uh, that you appreciate that.